Once we've added half square triangles to our quilt skills, we can start thinking about smaller triangles or triangles in different relationships. And that's where the Ohio Star Quilt Block comes in because we're gonna make quarter square triangles on this episode of How to Quilt. Core skills of quilting is the half square triangle, which is just what it sounds like. It is a square divided in half, making two right triangles. In addition to half square triangles, we can also make quarter square triangles. And if you follow the logic, a quarter square triangle is a square divided into four different triangles. To make quarter square triangles, we're going to start by making half square triangles, and then we're going to combine two HSTs to make one QST, quarter square triangle. We're gonna do that in the context of the Ohio Star Block, which is a very traditional, beautiful quilt block. It might remind you of the nine patch because what you'll start to see as you get more experience making quilt blocks, especially traditional quilt blocks, is that a lot of them follow this grid structure. So you'll see a three by three grid or a four by four grid where each segment of the grid or unit, each square in that grid can be replaced by another element from a different block. That's true for a lot of the blocks in this sampler quilt, where as long as the measurements of the unit are identical, you can sort of pick and choose cafeteria style what elements you want to include. You might also start developing sort of a quilter's eye where you begin to see shapes out in the world around you that remind you of particular elements inside a quilt block. And that can give you some great ideas for how to take these traditional quilt blocks and turn them into something that suits your personal style. That's one of the great things about quilting and I hope you'll pick up on that as we work on this Ohio Star quilt block. We've got our pieces of fabric cut out according to our pattern. You'll notice that when of this wasabi color and then four of this plummy color are already cut to four and a half inches square. So think through just a smidge like what you know about our basic math, just arithmetic here. The plan is that we have one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So a grid of nine squares these four will be filled in with our quarter square triangles to make our design. So the unfinished unit here will be four and a half inches, which is the same as this four and a half inches, which is the same as this four and a half inches. So it'll all go together to make our 12 and a half inch block when we're ready. For now, we're gonna set these aside because we don't need them until after we make our quarter square triangles. But because our target size is four and a half, these are much bigger than four and a half. These are six and a half. So we've got our two of this medium sort of dovey gray color. And we've got our two of this plummy color. And then we've got four of this lighter pinky color. What do we call this? Cotton candy, bubble gum, whatever it is we want to call this. So what we want to make are half square triangles. When we made half square triangles for our pinwheel block, we did four at a time, in which case I would have taken my two fabrics right sides together and gone ur, 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 all the way around all four sides so that I can cut into four. This time though, I want to make two at a time. So I'm gonna take my two fabrics right sides together and I'm actually going to draw on them. So one of this cotton candy color and one of the plum, one of this gray color. All right, so here we go. We've got our pairs. I'm going to take my ruler here and a marking tool. I really like this particular product and um, which I've linked to on the howtoquilt.video site. Um, because it's got a little a little tiny like razor wheel and it lays down some chalk and it makes a super accurate very specific line so i've taken my clear acrylic ruler here and i've gone from point to point and i've drawn a single line dead through the center if you really 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 love specificity you can use your 45 degree angle here 
line that up with the raw edge of your square at the point and draw your line that way. But because of the placement on my ruler, I end up having to move my ruler. Um, so instead I make sure that I'm at the, at the corners and I draw a line. I'm going to repeat that here on the other, which gives me a chance to demonstrate again. So I'm lining my ruler up with my point, lining it up with my other point, and I'm gonna draw my line. And now I'm gonna take it to the machine and I'm going to sew two seams, one a quarter inch on this side and one a quarter inch on this side so that this center line does not get stitched. I'm sewing on either side of that line and putting the edge of my quarter inch presser foot right up against the line that I've just drawn. And I've got my chalk line that I've drawn and my quarter inch presser foot. I'm gonna place the corner up underneath so that the edge of my quarter inch presser foot is along that chalk line. Do you see how because my needle is positioned down, I can bump my fabric up against that needle. So I'm starting right at the edge and then I'm just gonna sew along one side. I've already sewn one. I'm gonna sew the next. And the, the technique is the same, even though I've already got one under here. This is a great skill to have in your quilting. It's called chain stitching. So I've sewed this piece, and if I put my needle down and I raise my presser foot up, you can see the fabric is just beyond the needle. It's already fed through. But I'm gonna leave my presser foot down, and I'm gonna place this piece in position the chalk line is next to the presser foot, and I'm gonna keep sewing. The machine can go four or five, eh, I mean three or four stitches with nothing underneath it without really getting upset with you. Chain stitching simply means that I don't have to take this piece off and cut the thread in order to start the next one. So if I have a lot of segments to do that are the same, I can do them a lot more efficiently. For now, I'm just gonna do these two because I wanna demonstrate how I make these triangles without having to get up, down, up, down, up, down from the machine over and over again, or use up a ton of thread by starting and stopping. All right, so I've gone all the way through. I am gonna stop, pull it off the machine. Flip it around. These are still connected, right? So there's the thread where I chain stitched. It made it like, it's like bunting, right? My chalk lines are still in place. I line back up exactly how I did to begin, but now I'm on the opposite side. So this line of stitching is a quarter inch from this line, and I'll do a second line of stitching. When I get to the other end, I don't want to sew these to one another. It's really important that they're not on top of each other, but rather, feed it underneath, taking care that my chalk line is right on the edge of my presser foot. So when you're finished, you can see, I mean, I actually do make bunting this way, right? They're not stitched to one another. The threads are just connected, but it's a lot less wasteful of both your time and your thread wall and your energy. So let's take these back to the cutting table. And at the cutting table, we're gonna do a couple different things. One, we're gonna practice good, good technique. We're gonna trim away our thread. All right, now turning it back over so I can see my original line again. And I'm going to use my ruler and my rotary cutter to cut on the line that I drew. Because these two seam allowances were a quarter inch away from that line, I now have a quarter inch seam allowance for each of these, and I've made a half square triangle. Taking this half square triangle that we just made with the two at a time half square triangle technique, which again is different from the one that we used in the pinwheel block, which was a four at a time half square triangle, we've made these half square triangles two at a time because of the number that we need in our quilt block. 
and you can go out on the internet all over the place or you can upgrade to the how to quilt premium version to get additional methods for making half square triangles two at a time four at a time eight at a time one at a time depending on how many you need in a particular block we've made ours two at a time here because of the total necessary for our block and also as an opportunity to see how to make them and we're going to take those and combine them into our quarter square triangles right now. Over at the iron, we press our seam allowances to one side. So let's take a peek at this and talk about how a quarter square triangle works. Now I've got two half square triangles. Yes, these are the same color. These are different colors. If I place them up against one another, nest these seams and then I sew another seam here in the opposite direction so remember when we made our half square triangles four at a time and we cut this is similar but this time we're going to stitch and then when we fold it back that's the quarter square triangle and we've made this really cool design by combining two half square triangles into a quarter square triangle. Because I've pressed my seam allowances away from the cotton candy color, I can also nest my seams up against one another here before I stitch. So I'm nesting my seam allowances. It's okay if these edges aren't perfect. We're gonna trim this up after anyway, but I do wanna make sure that my Seam at the center is good and straight and aligned at an, uh, at an angle, 90 degree angle, to the line that I'm about to draw. So again, these guys are not as perfect because when I pressed it open, it can be manipulated and sort of um, distorted a little bit. But this line is really nice and it's perfectly perpendicular there. So then I go back to the machine and I sew a quarter inch on this side and a quarter inch on this side. Once that's stitched, we cut it apart exactly the same as before. And this is where you start to see that these edges being flawless is not as important as these seams being 90 degrees and nested. Look, how beautiful that is, it's so pretty, oh, I love it. So now we're gonna press it up and then we're going to repeat until we have four exactly the same. Oh, there they are. I just, I find quarter square triangles so satisfying, they're really pretty. Think back, remember that our target size for these is four and a half inches square. But like a lot of other things in quilting, it's possible to make these oversized so that when we come back to them later, we can trim them down to size. So this makes a very oversized square. What is this measuring in? Right around five inches. But I like that margin because it means I can center this point using my six and a half inch ruler. And I'm gonna trim a little off each side. I can't trim all of it off one side and none of it off another and still expect it to be balanced. So now that we've got our quarter square triangles finished and trimmed, they're four and a half inches square, which is a three by three grid for a 12 inch finished block. We're gonna put them all together, lay them out with our solid squares in order to more easily assemble the finished block for our Ohio star. I like to lay my parts out on the cutting table in front of me and then work sequentially from that situation. Some people though will do what's called a design wall and it's really just made of a piece of batting or a piece of flannel that's attached to a board or directly to the wall and lets them 
sort of um, stick their pieces of fabric to it. Like, I don't know if you ever did a flannel graph growing up where you could stick different, you know, little play pieces to the, to the piece of flannel and just let static hold them there. A design wall will do that. There are lots of tutorials available online for how to make one. And that can be a great place to store unfinished blocks if you can't afford the table space to leave them out until your next quilting session. I think that the blocks that are included in the How to Quilt video series are something that you can accomplish in a single sitting, but don't ever put the pressure on yourself to finish everything right away. Some of the joy of quilting is in the anticipation. So if you know that you've got cut pieces of a quilt waiting for you at home, you can build anticipation and excitement for the moment when you ah, get to sit down and sew. So let's clear our workspace away here and start laying some things out. We know that we want this pickle wasabi color here in the center. And then this guy, this guy, there we go. So we're making this checkerboard pattern and we're treating this plum color as if it's a background. So when I lay this out and I orient that plum color out to the side that way, it creates this illusion that I have a square and another square and then this star and then this background that's picked up here. So this is where we get to a place where the construction of the block is so similar between designs. And then I'm gonna go one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, to make three separate rows. And then I'm gonna stitch row to row. Keep in mind that each time we talk about that, we are saying it's implied that we're always stitching right sides together. So I'm gonna take this piece and make it right sides together. And then I'm gonna take this piece and make it right sides together, press my seam allowances, and then same thing, right sides together, right sides together, press my seam allowances, right sides together, right sides together. Now, as I'm pressing my seam allowances, did you notice that I said, press your seam allowances, press your seam allowances, press your seam allowances. Why would I do that? Here's another quiz. If you said to nest them, you're correct. If I press my seam allowances away and then toward and then away, they will nest when I assemble. The same thing is true if I press all my seam allowances this way for this row and then all my seam allowances this way for this row and then all my seam allowances this way both achieve the same desired outcome, which is that when I attach this row to the one below it, the seam allowances will nest. So thinking that through at this stage before I assemble each row individually helps me plan out my pressing to get a better, flatter final block that has less volume to quilt through later. at the sewing machine and I'm stitching my rows together and I want us to remember we worked on our pinwheel block and we wanted to preserve the points of our triangles remember we were shooting to stitch right into that intersection there this is one of those times when a scant quarter inch seam allowance really won't serve you it really needs to be as accurate as you can make it so I've pinned where I've nested those seams to prevent them from shifting. And as I stitch, I'm gonna sew just a little to the side right there. Oh, boom, to preserve those points.
So let's say in your block you have a little spot that looks like this, right? So this is kind of where I was saying, mm, do you wanna get hung up on perfectionism? This is what we're looking for in a block like this where we preserved our points and everything comes together. It almost gives the illusion that this is one square inside another whole square. This is what happens when we don't get perfect trimming. So as I was trimming this quarter square triangle, those points got cut off because my ruler was not lined up here as accurately as it could have been. I've got a couple of different options for what to do when I have a less than desirable outcome like this. I can take this row out and attempt to stitch it together in a way where I can minimize that error. I can take this row out, make another quarter square triangle and replace it. I can take this entire block and set it aside until I get to the end of my quilt and determine then, does this still bother me, right? Like sometimes something's driving you crazy and there's this like urgent pressure, I gotta fix it right now. But then down the road, you're like, eh, I really wasn't that big a deal. Maybe this bugs you oh, so much right now, but six months from now, it won't bother you at all. Or a week from now, when you finish this quilt, it won't bother you at all. Sometimes it's hard to know. Um, and so some of the best advice that I've ever gotten that's been reinforced over and over through quilting has been, it's okay to do nothing for a minute. Not, not forever. It doesn't mean you're lazy. It doesn't mean you failed. It doesn't mean that it's flawed. It, you know, like maybe it's imperfect, but some of those imperfections will bother you later and others just won't be that big a deal. And you might pull this back out down the road um, and do what has happened to all of us. You look at it and you go, actually, it's bothering me more now. At which point you can take this row out and make a new quarter square try. You know, easy peasy. Everything can be fixed if you decide it's worth fixing. If you don't want to fix this today, don't. Set this block aside until we're ready to assemble our entire quilt and determine then whether you've achieved the level that you want of accuracy. Right? I'm really satisfied with this. I'm less satisfied with this. Yeah? And one of the things that I teach my students all the time is not I made a mistake or I screwed up or this sucks, but rather I'm not satisfied with my results. That's fine. We can do it over. And there's your finished Ohio Star. I really love this particular block design. Um, I really love the way you can play with color in an Ohio Star. Uh, I've worked very intentionally in designing this particular one so that you can start to see how in the quarter square triangles which color goes in which segment of the unit can dramatically alter the final appearance of the block. I also want you to think about the idea that a lot of the fabrics you're using are prints. These are all solids. I've intentionally chosen all solids for our sampler quilt, but you might choose prints, or you might be someone who came to quilting because you love the prints that are out there. Fussy cutting is a very specific technique that involves cutting around a part of a print that you especially like. So um, the kind of joke example I use is duckies and bunnies. Let's say that you have a fabric that's ducky bunny, ducky bunny, ducky bunny on the fabric. You want to make an Ohio star quilt. That center square, which for us was that wasabi chartreuse green color, could be a ducky in one, a bunny in another, a ducky in one, a bunny in another. Creating a cardboard template so that you can center a particular element or using a clear acrylic ruler so that you can see the design in your fabric and cut a particular size square with that graphic, that printed element in the middle of it that's called fussy cutting. And a block like Ohio Star really lends itself to creating a frame for that graphic. And it's such a fun way to explore using prints and colors in all of your quilting moving forward. The next thing we're gonna talk about in the How to Quilt video series is a new method for making quarter square triangles when maybe you don't need four like you did for the Ohio Star. That's on the next episode of How to Quilt.